I'm so thankful to be here. Um, I hope that the young people, millennials, will not make the mistakes that I made in my family, because now I'm 52, and I think they call that year, I'm over the hill as far as having children, but I learned so much of what I'm sharing tonight way too late. And so my hope is that one day, you know, everybody here can bring two millennials because they need not make the mistakes that I made in my life, okay? So with that, what we want to do is um, better appreciate that worldview really does matter. So who's ever heard that term worldview? Okay, like a, or a biblical worldview, a secular humanist worldview, a Marxist worldview, then they have, they have others, but those are the three. And then now we have, you know, that's beating the doors down on, on America is the Islamic worldview. Um, then you have the New Age and all this. But we're going to better understand tonight, hopefully, how the secular humanist worldview has really impacted America and families. So tonight we're going to be looking at the formation of NARAL Pro-Choice America, how that happened. Um, Dr. Bernard Nathanson's propaganda campaign, the, you're going to leave here tonight knowing the eight points of his propaganda campaign. We're going to look at in depth the Catholic strategy and, and its consequences. So that's what you'll be learning. So are you ready? Okay, all right. Let's see. Um, in order to understand Dr. Nathanson, you need to understand in context when he arrived on the scene, what had already happened to the United States of America. And of course, everybody in here probably knows who Margaret Sanger was. What you might not know, though, is her campaign, this whole pro abortion America, I mean, not pro abortion, pro contracepting America, uh, birth control America, had already been around for 50 years. She started back in the 19 teens, then she really kicked off in 1921 in New York City, and then she just she steamrolled ahead. So I've always joked around that because of the promise I made to Dr. Nathanson, which you'll hear about that later on, I just want to work as hard as Margaret Sanger because she had outstanding results, and that's the only thing I admire about Margaret Sanger. She didn't stop till she had victory over the United States of America. Okay, so that's her date of birth and her date of death, so kind of keep that in mind. 1966, she, she had already passed. Now, the other thing to understand, who recognizes this name, Dr. Alfred Kinsey? Just show of hands. Anybody? Okay, anybody not ever heard of him? Okay, few people? Okay. Um, thank you for being honest. Dr. Alfred Kinsey, Margaret Sa he piggybacked on, if you will, Margaret Sanger's information because Margaret Sanger believed in sexual promiscuity. She practiced it, she promoted it, she wrote about it, and she hated marriage. And now this guy comes onto the scenes in the late 1940s and the 1950s, Dr. Alfred Kinsey. He was a zoologist, but all of a sudden he decided he would begin to supposedly study human sexuality. And he published a book in 1948, The Human Sexuality of the Male, and in 1953, The Human Sexuality of the Female. What he was really setting out to do is to try to prove that humans are sexual from birth. And in order to um, support his theory, they did sexual experiments on children all the way as young as two months old. Now, he was a sexual deviant. He was a homosexual. He was addicted to masturbation. He practiced all of the above. And he was a pedophile. Most of this happened at Indiana University. It probably still goes on today. But what you need to know as a Christian and why worldview really does matter is that when he released his scientific study and let it be known, it was just pseudoscience. It was most of it was just lies and deception. But he didn't just release it. He, he had all of academia ready to support and prop him up. And so it was on the front cover of Time magazine back in the 50s when he released one of the books. Everybody was talking about it. Now, what does this remind you of? Who recently became supposedly a female? Uh, right. Did he just do it and like just live his life? No, 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 no. It was a big media splash. That's what Alfred Kinsey did to promote this idea that people are sexual from birth. And what that will do is it'll, it supported all of what we've seen, the destruction in America. So I have a picture of the Bible and, and then the word science. This is the key thing for you to know on Alfred Kinsey. Number one, he was a sexual deviant and he was a pedophile. Number two, because of Alfred Kinsey and what he unleashed onto America, our laws in America 
shifted from Bible-based law or common law, you know, that we got from, you know, England to science-based law. And because of that, we have age of consent de decreasing, age of consent. We had no-fault divorce. Hugh Hefner loved what Alfred Kinsey said, and Hugh Hefner, and he's basically kind of quasi-partnered, and we got Playboy, and he was the father right here of this pornography pandemic that we have today. So Margaret Sanger and Dr. Alfred Kinsey. Okay, so, but he died in 1956. So, back to Margaret Sanger, 1960, she had already secured the funding for the birth control pill, and this thing got unleashed onto America, and of course, that's all sex without consequences. Sex went from creation to, um, to just recreation, and something else happened, though. In 1968, we had four warnings from somebody, and I, I have a free DVD for you. If you, if the first person who will raise their, or first person to shout it out, say, who were, who were, Paula Six. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> and what she said, for those of you who don't know, here you go, uh, Pope Paul the Six, 1968, he came out with warnings. Thank you. Come on up here. Get your DVD. Let's give her a hand. Because <laughs> I have sat in audiences where people are like, hmm, who, who is this? Yeah, I, it's just that, yeah, um, um, the, so for the four warnings, There'd be a general, you know, as women and men, we try to control, you know, our creation and, um, and try to be the masterminds of our bodies. Well, what was going to happen was the general decrease in, um, um, in morality. There'd be an increase in infidel infidelity. Women would be looked at as just mere sex objects. And then, for those poor little sisters of the poor, <laughs> government would get involved in health care. Now... Who said it? Of course, we have Pope Paul, the Humanae Vitae, 1968. I'm a revert, okay? I was baptized at St. Leo's back 1963. And um, long story, but I'm recently a revert. And I wish I had known. I wish a Catholic person had walked up to me and explained to me Humanae Vitae. And since nobody else did it, I want to do it and I want to shout it across the United States of America. Because I was a bad little teenager, and I went on to the birth control pill when I was 16 years old. I didn't come off of it till I had my second child at 35. I now know that all those years of consuming this pill, I was consuming a class one carcinogen. And that hurts. And then I found out that when a woman's on the birth control pill that long a time, you're probably losing a child every 18 months. So I have two daughters, but they're missing about 12 siblings. And I would have come off that birth control pill if somebody had sat down with me and said, let me teach you about the beauty of the dignity of human life. But not one Catholic walked up to me to say, I want to share something with you. Not one priest. And I could go on and on. And that, my friends, my fellow friends here, Christians, we need to change that. Because this poor man... I've, the reading I've done, it seems to me, half of the Catholic Church, if not more, turned away from Pope Paul and said, that's a stupid, ridiculous idea. Why? Because they bought the lies of Margaret Sanger. They bought into the dogma, the doctrine, the deposit, if you will, of Margaret Sanger. And we have to crush that because it's killing America. So, and if you hear my passion in my voice... I'm dead serious about it. Why do I say dead serious? Because we're leaving behind dead babies, women are getting cancer, and it's wrecking families. It's wrecking marriages. Biologically, it wrecks marriages. So, enough of that. So, in walks Dr. Nathanson. But let's better understand the context here. The beginning is a, a 1967 dinner party. And this man worked for the first communist card-carrying communist, and in Capitol Hill, 
Lawrence Later. He was very, very politically savvy. Radical ideas were nothing new for this man. Okay? He was, he was a, for sure he was a secular humanist, if not a full-blown Marxist. Okay? And he was ready. And what he wanted was, oh, he was best friends with Margaret Sanger. He, she died in 1966, and he immediately wrote a biography about Margaret Sanger. He really, really venerated her. All right, so at this dinner party in 1967, he meets Dr. Bernard Nathanson. Now, Dr. Nathanson, at that point, he was an OBGYN, and he had been seeing women come into um, New York hospitals with um, you know, botched abortions, not thousands of them, but certainly dozens of them in New York City. And um, he really, really wanted to do the right thing for women. Okay, he really felt like if abortion could just be legalized, these people wouldn't be, good, you know, doing the bad things, you know, with their bodies. And so he really wanted to help women with this uh, by making abortion legal. But he wasn't so bold to run around and talk about it. But this man on the left, Lawrence Later, he shouted it out over the dinner table. It was the conversation that night. And so, over a glass of wine, they agreed that abortion will be legalized in all 50 states. And this fractured, it was a very fractured pro-abortion movement. Nobody had really organized it. And Lawrence Later said, if you want to create a political movement, we have to be organized. And so they set out. Uh, uh, they set out to form the National Association for the Repeal of Abortion Law. Today it's known as NARAL Pro-Choice America. Any, anybody ever heard of that? Okay, and anybody never heard? Because a lot of people have never heard of NARAL. Okay, you're not the only one. Every group I talk to, a lot of people, they've all heard about Planned Parenthood, but not NARAL. Okay, so Planned Parenthood obviously was already in existence. It was already renamed Planned Parenthood when, when NARAL formed, okay? But Planned Parenthood was not doing abortions. Okay, the lady in the middle. I've got another DVD to hand out. First one, shout it out. Who is she? Betty Friedan. Yeah, uh, Betty Friedan. Yeah, she, thank you for shouting that out. Um, Betty Friedan. Thank you. Uh-huh. Was a secular humanist. Many people believe she was a full-fledged communist. And Betty Friedan started the National Organization of Women, NOW. Anybody ever heard of that? Now. Okay. Just a little side story. When I went off to college in 1981, I remember calling my dad. I think it was in the month of November. Dad, there's this organization on campus called NOW, the National Organization of Women. And I'm thinking about joining. What do you think? And my father, who's very well-schooled and well-read, he's like, Terry Elizabeth, you better not come home being a member of the National Organization of Women. <laughs> and I did not join. Uh, but Betty Friedan, she organized this. And actually, it started out with fairly good intentions, you know, trying to break the glass ceilings and let women not be fired for being pregnant, you know, at their jobs. And, and, and because of a lot of the original feminist work, even way before Betty Friedan's age, um, you know, I was able to enter a man's world, the, the investment business. I was the only woman in a class of 30 men. And it treated me fantastically, and for that I'm thankful. But what happened is Lawrence later convinced Betty Friedan that part of the National Organization of Women's mantra needs to be pro-abortion. And she at first really wasn't for that. In fact, they had their first NOW convention, and nothing really was said about abortion. That wasn't one of the topics. But for the next year, he worked on Betty Friedan. And that second annual convention, the sexual revolution of Lawrence Later, which is really Margaret Sanger, because he took her mantle and she shoved it into the National Organization of Women. It upset so many of the conservative women in it. Some walked out, some dropped their membership. They were so angry. But Betty Friedan got her way. And this, my friends, is how the feminist movement, which, you know, was all about suffrage in the very beginning and all this, got hijacked by the sexual revolution. Okay? So, with that being said, what else about the culture and context? Uh, we have, what about fetology? What did they know about the baby back in the late 1960s? Very, very little. There's a, uh, there's a medical journal called the Cumulative Medicus Index. 
and it accumulates all the articles on any given scientific topic uh, all around the world. So in 1969, I got another DVD to give away. How many articles do you think there were on fetal anatomy and physiology? None, okay, but well there were more than none. Five articles, and then in just um, 10 years later, guess how many articles there were? 2,800. Wow. Okay, that's 1979, so abortion is now legal. And then you go up a little bit more to uh, 1994, 5,000, and you can only imagine. I've tried to find it, but I can't find the data. I mean, it just, you know, I'm sure it's hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of articles about fetal anatomy and physiology. So basically, they didn't know. And actually, in this book, Dr. Nathanson has a chapter on fetology. There are only three chapters in this book. The Abortion Papers by Dr. Bernard Nathanson. One is on fetology, and it's, it's hilarious what they were doing back then to try to figure out the size of the baby and all. And they would have these contraptions they put on their head, and they'd lower their head down to the mother's abdomen. And it's just like, what were these guys doing? It was all like hocus pocus. Um, so, but the, so they didn't know. And then the other thing to understand, because sometimes you'll hear the, you know, the, the feminists now um, say, well, you know, this is all about you know, the health and safety of the mother. You know, so what about maternal deaths? Well, since 1930, uh, back then there were 700 maternal deaths per 100,000 births. Okay, 700 women were dying every year out of 100,000 births. But due to advances in science and medicine and antibiotics and you know, better C-sections and all this, by 1945, it was only 300 maternal deaths per year, per 100,000 births, live births. And then 1960, so when Margaret Sanger came out of the birth control pill, we were down to 30 maternal deaths per year, okay? So, huge, so this thing about, oh, it's about protecting the mother and all that, no, nah, nah, that's a lie. Okay, then, okay, so now we're getting ready to go over the eight-point strategy. If you happen to bring pencil and paper, this is what you'd want to take a few notes on. If you did not, that's fine, because if we get your email address today, your name, email address, we're going to email you this, a color brochure, a front and back, on Dr. Nathanson's Deadliest American Hoax, basically has all the information that you would want, and extra, okay? Um, and we'll email it to you in color, so you can, okay, so you don't really have to take notes. All right, so it's an eight-point strategy, and it's all based on lies and deception. This is how Dr. Nathanson deceived America and the United States Supreme Court. The first thing he did was they had to frame the debate. So NARAL is now organized, and they've done their fundraising, and uh, they have to, you know, they can't go out and say, we support killing babies in the womb. That's not going to work. So they framed it around choice, and anybody knows whoever frames the debate can usually win the debate. So that was the first thing. Now the second one were the slogans, all these slogans that you, you know, I won't even say them because we've all heard them, right? They literally worked with a public relations firm, a communications firm, and, and they, every single step, they wanted to appeal to a part of our human nature. Sometimes it was a, to appeal to our American human nature, if you will, like patriotism and individualism and independence and liberty. And, and so there was a reason for all of these different words. Then the third step, where the, uh, he um, used the complicit media. Dr. Bernard Nathanson was, um, you know, obviously, he was an OBGYN. So if you were the press, and he called a, a press conference, well, and most of you back then in 1960s who were coming out to report on the pro-abortion movement, the pro-choice movement, you were young, you were females, you had graduated from a very liberal university, and, and, and you were tired of being against the Vietnam War, and this gave you something that you could be for. Perfect timing, okay? So, and you would, you would not ask Dr. Nathan some very many questions, okay? Because he's the OBGYN, you're just a little reporter, all right? Now, the other thing is step number four, he would, he would tell the media that one million women a year are having back alley abortions. 
One million women a year. We've all heard about all these back alley coat hanger abortions. I remember growing up and like hearing about it, but I didn't know anybody. Well, I didn't know anybody because I shouldn't have known anybody because there weren't one million back alley abortions happening. The real number, there were about 100,000 illegal abortions. And I want you to keep this in the right context. This was a decision that a woman had made, sometimes under pressure, of course, you know, by a boyfriend, husband, or somebody, mother, um, but to choose to make a criminal decision. Okay? So it's a criminal activity. All right, so he would say one million, the real number was 100,000. Now, the other thing was he would say 5,000 to 10,000 women a year are dying because of illegal abortions. And it was a bald face lie. The bigger the lie, the easier it was to deceive America. Doesn't it remind you of a movement that's happening today all across America? Yeah. Okay. The real number, and this is on the high side, about 250 abortions, I mean deaths per year. Okay, and that's on the high side. I've talked to Governor Sam Brownback, and he said they researched this, and he said they couldn't even come up with this high of a number. Okay, all right, then the other thing. Now, isn't that bold? See how bold they are? And, and it's almost like um, that Veggie Tale video. I don't, I don't know if you have grandkids or kids. I, we had the, the, biggest, the biggest lie. And, um, you know, the bigger the lie got, and the more people he could deceive. And so here's the other big one. See, 60% of Americans want abortion on demand. 60%. Now, who enjoys being in a minority, per se? I mean, if like this, there's big movement going, it's just our nature, and I'm not, I mean, disregarding what the issue is, there's this natural inclination to not want to be left behind. So America's changing, right? Get with the times. He pulled this number out of thin air. Another DVD to give away. Guess what it was? What percent of Americans back in 1969, 1970 wanted abortion on demand? 5%, good guess. But it was one half of 1% of Americans. Page, I uh, usually have the page number, but it's in the book. One half of 1%. Okay, now, what happens in the media when the lie is told over and over and over again? Is it legal? Yeah, yeah. And then, step number seven, he rationalized decriminalizing abortion, and it became the self-fulfilling lie. Look, okay, remember, you're the reporters, I'm the OBGYN. Look, the women are going to do this anyway. They're going to do it anyway. So why make them a felon, okay? They're going to do it anyway. Let's just get it legalized, call it a day, and we know the rest is history, right? So it literally went from 100,000 illegal, and once it was uh, you know, decriminalized, they hit a million abortions in no time, the very number Dr. Nathanson originally said. All right, now step number eight. He implemented the Catholic strategy, and I love this, this, pic, this image here, because this is where religion and politics mix. So this notion that Christians are not to be involved in politics is false, right? Because God gives us government, right? And we need to be involved. So, now this, I'm going to put on my glasses, uh, and I'm going to read this slowly. I may read it twice, because it's very key for you to understand this one. This comes out of Dr. Nathanson's book here. The, and this was, this was from a high-level board meeting of, of uh, NARAL in 1971. Now, this is after they had overturned the New York anti-abortion law. That happened in 1970, okay? And this, this is, so Lawrence later, he calls a board meeting together. And he said, the major opposition to abortion law repeal comes from the Roman Catholic Church. Suggested ways to contend with this opposition were, and I'm gonna show you what these four points are. He explains four things that NARAL can do to try to shut the Catholic Church up. The opposition argument of abortion law repeal promoting promiscuity can be exploited to expose the immorality of the pregnancy as punishment philosophy. All right? Now, what he's saying here is that he admits 
that the, the opposition argument of abortion law repeal promoting promiscuity. I can't believe the man even said it, but he was in a private, high-level NARAL. They had, he had, he's admitting, you know, so if we can get abortion legalized, we can promote promiscuity all we want. And we can try to nail those pro-lifers, you know, because they keep trying to, um, you know, make a woman, you know, keep her pregnancy, and that's punishment for her promiscuity. Okay, so that's Lawrence later. And if I didn't make this clear, he, Dr. Nathanson, I mean, he was an atheist Jewish man, and he didn't have strong feelings against the Catholic Church or against Christians in general. Um, but Lawrence later vehemently despised the Catholic Church. Okay? All right, so, now here's another quote. The par and this is Dr. Nathanson in his book, years later after he becomes pro-life, he said the, that paragraph articulates clearly the Catholic strategy which he, Lawrence Later, and I, Nathanson, had agreed upon several years earlier as one of the most fruitful tactics to be pursued in the abortion wars. So he's talking about the Catholic strategy. So what was it? This, my friends, was and is the Catholic strategy. The first thing they would do is they would blame all Catholic leadership anytime a woman would die of an abortion. Okay, they would blame the Pope, they would blame the bishop, they would blame the local priests. It's all the Catholic hierarchy fault that a woman died uh, with an illegal abortion. Number two, they would support the small minority of Catholic candidates or legislators open to repealing the anti-abortion law. Now right now this is going on like in New York City. This is 1970. This is what they, whoo, they dove right in in New York. And, um, and it was again, it, there were a few Catholics um, who were either running for office or already held the office who were willing to, you know, change, reverse the anti-abortion laws, but it was certainly not the majority. And the third part was they would emphasize the small pro-choice uh, Catholic opinion and make it appear larger than it really was. In, in their, you know, in press conferences, anything. They're constantly, daily. You know, if they had email back then, it would have been a daily email you were getting. Okay, Catholic Church is changing. Get with the times, you know. Kind of like the LGBT movement, right? You know, gender is fluid. Don't you know that? Come on, get with the times. All right. And then lastly, they executed the Catholic straddle. Anybody ever heard of that? All right, well, I don't have any more DVDs to give away, so... so. <laughs> Um, all right, this is, well, we'll cover the Catholic strand in a second. Not only, did we, um, not only did we execrate the Catholic Church as the demonic opposition to our crusade, but on the infrequent, infrequent occasions when the church did summon up the courage to respond to our mostly intemperate attacks, we would accuse them of polarizing the country along religious lines. So what they were doing was a religious war. I mean, they were blaming, blaming. Anytime the Catholic Church would speak, oh, they blame the church on it, you know, that it was making a, um, drawing religious lines. For sheer schutzpah, the Catholic strategy had no, did I pronounce that right? <laughs> Thank you. Chutzpah, uh, had no modern parallel. Had no mo So years later, Dr. Nathanson, when he looked back at what they had done to the Catholic Church, you know, because he became Catholic, he felt very, very guilty over this. He was very, very remorseful. And so he said, let it be said, the church helped us in NARAL, the papal encyclical of 1968, denying both abortion and contraception to Catholics was a bonanza for us at NARAL at precisely the correct moment in history. Because as you well know, it, all those things were merging at the same time. Well, Margaret Sanger's mantra had already affected so many Catholics, they were already taking the birth control pill. And so to take that one step over to become pro-choice was not that far of a leap for Catholics anymore. Okay? Um, you know, I spent years being evangelical, you know, Protestant, and you know, and I know from all the research, I mean, they were already demanding abortion be legalized, most of the mainline Protestant denominations. They were already gone. So the only ones holding on were, were the Catholics. And half of those were already gone because of Margaret Sanger. Okay? Now, what about this thing called the straddle? All right. So what we're talking about here is, like, Jose Initiative, we're an educational ministry. 
Okay? We want to educate. Because we believe that you'll take this information and go use it wisely. NARAL was a political organization, and their definition of victory was to change the law. Right? So they had to have a political victory. And the way they would do it would be to persuade Catholics to separate their religious conviction you know, about women. Catholic doctrine is all about protecting the dignity of human life from legislative judgment. Okay? So what they would do inside the voter booth. Because if NARAL couldn't control that, they would be defeated. Okay? Their mission. So... Catholics can remain personally opposed to abortion, but everybody should be free to choose. We hear that all the time, don't we? This was a deliberate, intentional strategy. They literally sat around a table at the NARAL headquarters, and they planned this, that this is what they would say, this is what they would market. And free to choose, of course, we never say free to choose what, okay? So... So abortion is simply a blank between a woman and her doctor. <coughs> Fill in the blanks. I'll find something to give away. I actually have more DVDs, I think. A choice. A choice, yeah. Yeah, abortion is simply a choice. It's just what's well, actually a decision. Abortion is simply just a decision between a woman and her doctor. You know, so politicians keep your nose out of it. Well, how about the fathers? Talk about emasculating American men. Don't, uh, weren't they 50% partner in this new baby? Yeah. So, this, so between, you know, the, this all part of the Catholic straddle, you know, just the, do, you know, playing. Because if you think about it, for 1,970 years, just in terms of American history, we had never had to contend with this in the voter booth. It was illegal. There's no Roe v. Wade, right? So voters never had to figure this out. And that's why NARAL had to act swiftly. There you go. That's NARAL's deception, okay? This is what Dr. Bernard Nathanson did, and those are the eight points, and if we get your email, we'll email you out. Okay, so 1970, let's talk about how they flipped that law in New York, okay? New York, um, a number of states had already flipped their anti-abortion laws. New York was, I think it was the 13th state. I need to double check that. Um, but it's 1970, and Planned Parenthood, the, um, they're trying to they have a, a, a bill on the floor. Lawrence later goes and he pummels the legislators. Okay, he's making sure as many as possible will vote to f to destroy a 140-year-old anti-abortion law that had been um, yeah that had been on books for 140 years. And Dr. Nathanson goes to Planned Parenthood, New York uh, Board of Directors, and he's an invited guest. And he goes in to make his pitch why, why, why Planned Parenthood needs to join with NARAL, channel, funny, funnel money to, to NARAL and get ready to join with this whole pro-abortion movement. And NARAL, if you were the board of directors, everybody would sit there just like you're looking at me now. Don't change your facial expression. That, that's what Dr. Nathanson was getting. Kind of blank faces, stares. And he thought, they're not gonna help me. And he was exactly right. In April 1970, the New York anti-abortion bill was crushed. In basically 18 months, they had flipped by this eight-point uh, deceptive strategy, a 140-year-old law, flipped it. New York, uh, New York um, passed the most liberal pro-abortion bill into law, and Planned Parenthood did not help Dr. Nathanson. They were not doing abortions, okay? But... A couple weeks later, not a couple, a couple months later, into 1970, 71, Dr. Nathanson gets a phone call from Planned Parenthood because they realize all the money that they're leaving on that table. And they asked Dr. Nathanson, would he train them in doing abortions and running an abortion facility? And Dr. Nathanson goes and he trains them. And for the next two years, they take copious notes why Dr. Nathanson trains what becomes the largest abortion provider in the history of the world, Planned Parenthood. The other thing to know is that first year, Dr. Nathanson was the only one, as far as he knew, that guessed it correctly how many abortions would happen in New York 
It was 250,000. So before it was 100,000 nationwide, illegal, and now when they legalize it, whoa, hey, it's legal, let's go do it, 250,000. Okay, now the abortion papers, those embarrassing survivors, Lauren Slater is freaking out, okay, and I literally am freaking out because there are saline late-term abortion survivors. Let me read this. The, this. the meeting had been called by Lawrence Later in order to counter what he perceived to be a serious threat to abortion advocacy, the increasing number of live-born infants emerging from second trimester saline abortions. Later saw these abortion survivors as an embarrassment to NARAL and was concerned that the press had made much of them and that the opposition elements were seizing upon them as a tactic in the abortion wars. Lawrence Later was embarrassed. And Dr. And, and Dr. Nathanson, that's when they went out and they started holding more symposiums on how to do late-term abortions and all that. Because he said if a late-term abortion is done properly, the baby arrives dead, right? Okay, he doesn't say how it arrives, all shriveled up and burnt up, and literally the baby breathed in the saline, and it destroyed the baby's lungs and burnt the baby from inside out. So the rest of the story is this. When, new, when they had overturned the New York anti-abortion law in 1970, a couple months later, Dr. Nathanson uh, uh, went to work at an abortion facility called CRASH. It was a center for reproduction, reproductive and sexual health, and it was basically an abortion facility. They were killing about 800 babies a week, 24-7, um, other than you know, 363 days a year, other than two days. And um, so, let's see, the other thing, oh, he was chief, oh, so at the end of 1972, so right before Roe v. Wade, He's exhausted. He had been traveling the world, I mean, the nation as a political lobbyist, you know, testifying in state legislatures uh, to legalize abortion. He was birthing babies. He was killing babies. Uh, he was NARAL, you know, executive director. So he's busy with all that. He's spent. He's tired. He's crashed. He's still pro-abortion, but he resigns from the abortion facility where he was, where they were killing 800 babies a week. And he takes a job as the chief of obstetrics at St. Luke's Hospital in New York City. And um, at this point, this is the beginning of 1973, and then Roe v. Wade happens on January 22nd, 1973. He celebrates. It's a rah-rah victory. He's happy. And a couple months goes by, and he's, he, he experiences this real whipsaw feeling in his life because if a woman comes into the hospital in premature labor, you know, say six months or seven months, and he's trying to do his best to save the life of this baby. But there were some days when he would be doing that, and when after he saved the life of that baby, he would go three floors up in the hospital, and a woman would be in there six or seven months pregnant, and she wants a late-term abortion, and he was killing the baby three floors up. And so this became the way, am I here to kill or I'm here to save? Am I here to kill or am I here to save? And it was like, ooh, that's real. Okay, and then, as many of you know, um, it was within probably four months of the Roe v. Wade decision, St. Luke's Hospital rolls in a brand new technology, real-time ultrasound, and Dr. Nathanson sees that baby moving in a clear image. Now, um, I don't even, I think I actually skipped this part. So in, in, I went up to New York to interview Dr. Nathanson uh, December 1st, 2009, okay? I sat with him. He was 83 then, and he was terminally ill with cancer. And, um, and, and what he shared, uh, as, as he shared many times other places, but what he shared with me is when he looked at that baby on real-time ultrasound, um, he was able to bond with the baby and love the baby and uh, admire you know, the, the growth and just all the things that real-time ultrasound shows. So when I sat down with him, I was actually thinking he had never seen the baby on ultrasound. I was wrong. He had, but it was only those still pictures, the real grainy pictures that they used to have. And now it's 4D ultrasound. Uh, okay, and so the other thing is, um, yeah, and he remains on the NARAL executive team. Um, even after he sees the baby on real-time ultrasound, and he's just really torn, okay? 
Um, and as I said, then we got the Roe v. Wade decision, and he admits to stripping the unborn child of all rights and protections with the Roe v. Wade decision. And then we launch into the rest of his story, and this is what he told me when I sat beside him. He said, Terry, real-time ultrasound was the bomb. It made everything come alive. And it was just one of those quotes that just, I mean, I wrote it down, but it just seared in my memory. And, um, and, I, and this is a picture of him a couple years before I, I, I was with him. I did not take my camera. I wish I had. Uh, but I will tell you that as he sat on his sofa in this little apartment up in Manhattan, New York, he was very frail. I mean, he looked like maybe he was 120 pounds. And... Um, and even though he, he lived for another year and one month, he died February 2011, but he was so remorseful. Um, and I just, my heart just real swelled with compassion for this, for this old man. Um, so, so what happened? The rest of the story, this is one of his quotes. This was in his resignation letter to NARAL, which happened two years after Roe v. Wade. He submitted it to NARAL on the second Roe v. Wade anniversary, okay? So this is part of what's in his letter. And you are the first audience I have presented this to, okay? Because uh, I, I, very few people have seen what, what's, what's right here. The judgments of the Supreme Court were never meant to be infallible or eternal. And what if we've been wrong? If the court should soon reverse itself on the abortion issue in light of changing times and or new scientific evidence, what an immeasurable, irretrievable loss will have been suffered. The annual dues of NARAL are $10 and the hubris of certainty. Regretfully, I can no longer meet those dues. And he resigned from NARAL. Okay, and then as most of you know, he made the silent scream video, okay? Raise your hand if, if, you, if you know about the silent scream or if you've seen it, okay? Has anybody never heard of the silent scream? I'm very interested. Okay, a few people, it's okay, yeah. Every audience, there, there are a few that have never heard of it. So it's 1985, 86, and he asks one of his abortion friends if they would do, if he would do an ultrasound of an abortion on a 12-week-old baby. And they do it, and then they all sit down. It was the abortionist plus Dr. Nathanson plus the nurse to watch this raw video footage. And what they see is so shocking that the abortionist quits his, uh, he quits doing abortions. They were doing about 20 a day. And the nurse quits the practice in general. He's still living, Dr. J. Kellenson from New Jersey and uh, never to do another abortion again because what they see is what Dr. Nathanson says here. At one point, viewers see the child draw back uh, from the surgical instruments and open his mouth. This is the silent scream of a child threatened imminently with extinction. And that's the, the, that's, those are the cries that we're not hearing, that we, I mean, some way, <coughs> somehow, we have to resensitize America that we're not hearing these, you know, the cries of the oppressed. All right, Dr. Nathanson admits to fast-tracking Margaret Sanger's, what she called the Negro Project. Okay, that was 1939. She set out to reduce, if not completely eliminate, the black race. She called it the Negro Project. Um, they've tried to push the birth control pill into black communities, and most black folks uh, um, resisted the birth control pill because they smelled something that didn't smell right, okay? And, she, and the people who ended up taking it were like middle-class white Americans. So it was just the opposite of what she wanted to happen. Um, so when abortion became legalized, and they set those abortion facilities up inside the black communities, it was Margaret Sanger. Granted, she was you know, already deceased, but basically, it's Margaret Sanger's dream come true. And, and today, you know, black abortions are, 36% of all abortions are on little black babies. So the most dangerous place for a black person to be is in his mother's womb. Okay? All right. So this is Margaret Sanger uh, talking to the KKK. And in fact, 
she enjoyed this so much and she got such a positive response from the KKK women, these are the women, um, that she wrote about it in her book and she received numerous invitations all up and down you know, the East Coast to speak at KKK. So have we forgotten that worldview matters? Um, I, it's been a while, but I used to do a lot of speaking in the minority community. And when I would share about Margaret Sanger's Negro Project and how Dr. Nathanson fast-tracked it, and then I show this slide right here, I will have people who will say they will get their phones out and they will take pictures because very few people have ever seen the real title to Charles Darwin's book. Okay, and if you, oh, this is very difficult to see. So you've, everybody's heard of On the Origins of Species by Means of Natural Selection. Everybody's heard that. But they whitewash the subtitle, and that subtitle says, or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. This is secular humanism, you know. And so, um, yeah, on the origin of species by means of natural, I've had numerous people, they're like, don't change that slide, or they ask me to go back to it, and they want to take a picture, okay? This is what our children are not learning. World views have consequences. Think about Down syndrome babies, you know? So, that's Margaret Sanger. Okay, now, somebody asked me about Father C. John. There he is as a young man. <laughs> So what happened is 19, no, Dr. Nathanson goes into a really black period of his life. You know, now he's understanding, oh my gosh, you know, these silent screams. And he's looking at what he's done. This, he's, no, he's unleashed the culture of death onto America. And he, he contemplates suicide numerous times, but he convinces himself that his patients need him too much, so he doesn't do it. And um, 1990, he's seeking answers. And he seeks it in many different areas. But one of the places is he had crossed paths with Father C. John McCluskey, who was baptized at Thomas More Church here, born and raised right up here. And by that point, he was living in New York City. And Father C. John becomes Dr. Nathanson's spiritual advisor for five years. And then on the solemnity of the Immaculate Conception of Mary, he's received into the Catholic Church and at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. Just a beautiful story. And uh, this is one of, I think, just as a key quote from Dr. Nathanson. The crime of permissive abortion is such an unmitigated evil in its own right that it stands on its own, requiring a comparison with nothing else. But he was Jewish. The Holocaust had grieved him, the extent of the Holocaust. He knew the abortion wars were so far greater than the Holocaust. Okay, then he ends this book with this quote. I believe that an America which permits a junta of moral thugs to foist an evil of incalculable dimensions upon it and continues to permit that evil to flower creates for itself a deadly legacy a millennium of shame. Ouch. And then, so this notion that abortion is a personal decision, how wrong that is. And this is, has been my experience to, to go from a woman who in the 20s and 30s, I was never like pro-abortion or pro-choice. I was more just kind of ambivalent about it. I'd, I'd never thought about it. I'd never studied about it. And then when I turned um, 40, I, I was homeschooling my children then. I'm, I'm no longer homeschooling them. Uh, but I began, um, it was a couple things. I, I, was, I was pondering over how had we come from the Civil War only now to dehumanize another group of people. I was a little baffled over that. And then I began to research and research and research. And now I was no longer working in the investment field. I had time to get involved more in politics. And I realized that, wait a minute, this, there was a paradox. That I had had the grand opportunity to work in what had always been a man's world, the investment world, thanks to the original feminists who broke down a lot of walls and ceilings. But the same feminists were stealing my parental rights to guide, pray, and nurture my own children. 
as I took my daughter to a sports physical at our Christian pediatrician. And that pediatrician said, Terry, you're not going to like what I have to ask your daughter now that she's 14 years old. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, oh, well, the Virginia law was changed a while back. And she turned to my daughter and she said, Kirsten, can your mom stay in the room with us? Well, I could hear my pulse beating through my ears, you know, my blood pressure. And, uh, and I said, you're kidding me. This is in Virginia. And she said, yeah, it's been on the books like this for quite a while now. She said, Terry, it's so bad now. Your parental rights have been taken away so badly that your daughter could have syphilis, be dying of gonorrhea and pregnant at the same time. And I can't tell you. Welcome to Virginia. And it's like this in many, many other states. So this idea that abortion, decriminalized abortion, is a personal decision? Oh, no, 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 no. That's a huge lie. And we don't have time to go over all these categories. But I like to go down here to like at 4 o'clock, you know, God's protection. How long can the United States spit in the face of God and say, we're going to do it our way? And the heck with you, God. How long? So... If radicalized Islam moves all over America and they begin doing what they do best, chopping off heads, I say, why will it upset us? <laughs> We've been cutting off heads and arms and legs for 40, what, 43 years? What difference does it make? Does worldview really matter? So as I interviewed Dr. Nathanson, First, I need, it's funny because I didn't open up with this. I want to tell you how I, how I went up there. Uh, the video I was passing out uh, earlier, yeah, this one here, Ma'afa 21. This is a two and a half hour documentary about Planned Parenthood and black genocide. It's all devoted to what Margaret Sanger had out for blacks in America. And I had already done a bunch of research, and I had formed this little organization to go around and teach pastors and anybody who would come out and listen. And somebody referred me to a black minister, a Protestant minister in rural Virginia. And, and I asked him for a three-hour appointment, two and a half hours to watch this and then a half hour to talk. And the man said, do you really need three hours? And I said, yes, sir, I need three. <laughs> and um, we watched this together. And when I walked into his church, I, mean, I, I told myself, Terry, do not say anything about politics because I truly did not want him to think, because I wasn't, I didn't want him to think I was there to try to get a vote for a certain, you know, any which way. I just wanted him to know about Margaret Sanger and the Negro Project. So we watched this, and at the end I said, Pastor Bibbins, tell me what you think. And he rolled his chair forward on those wheels, and he wagged his finger, and I literally thought, he hates all white people. <laughs> I was scared. I was very unsettled. And he said, I'll tell you what I think. I will never vote for a pro-choice candidate ever again, for if I do, I'm voting to annihilate my own race, and furthermore, abortion is just wrong. I could not believe my ears. And I felt like, that's all figure of speech here, I felt like God had pulled back a little curtain that if we're going to save America, we've got to keep elevating the gift of life. It took race off the table. We no longer saw each other as black and white and whoever else was there. It was all, we're Christians, we're human, we're all part of the human family. And I came there to love this man with the truth. And, and his response, in addition to so much more, was just so beautiful. And so, um, so that was April of 2009. Then he had me come back to his church in June of 2010 and to, to teach the whole church. And it was to show this movie, plus we did so much more. We studied fetal development together, and we opened up the Word of God. What does God say about life? Then we went over all the, the um, secular, all the, there are 39 pro-choice arguments that they use, the feminists use, but there are 221 rebuttals, and that's before you even open up the Word of God just applying logic, okay? So 39 pro-choice arguments, but there are 229 rebuttals using logic before you open up the Word of God. 
It was amazing. They thanked me. The teenagers were like, oh, Mrs. Beatley, you know, we want to help. We want to help create a culture of life. And uh, it just went on and on. It was just beautiful. So, so, so then I go into a very prayerful mode because, I, I mean, the response had been overwhelming. And I went to the, uh, the church I was at at that time, and we had a 24-hour prayer vigil. I signed up for the first hour, and I'm sitting in this large church all by myself, and I am praying fervently. And everybody knows what I mean. Sometimes we can pray, and then other times we're super-duper praying. And it was one of those prayers. And my prayer was just simply this, God, show me what am I supposed to do with this head full of information and, and the experience that I've had reaching across to people, you know, you know, that normally I'm not hanging out with, and, uh, but yet made wonderful friends, and we're still friends, and all I could hear was, you need to go interview Dr. Bernard Nathanson. And I sat there and I thought, God, I've read one of his books, but why would this man say yes to me? I'm a little homeschool mom from Virginia. He's an icon, and it's like, why would he say yes? And all I could hear was, you need to go interview the doctor who who um, taught Planned Parenthood how to do abortions, go interview Dr. Bernard Nathanson. So I tried to find, I knew I'd lost the argument, and a couple days later I had secured his, what I thought at that time was his unlisted telephone number, and um, his wife said it was never unlisted, but I could never find it. And uh, I was on a plane December 1st, 2009, to interview him. And at the end of the interview, I said, Dr. Nathanson, if you have a message for America, I promise you I will deliver it across our country until it becomes common knowledge or until Roe v. Wade is overturned or I die, whichever comes first. And I had no idea. I didn't know if he'd be like, Terry, my days are done or whatever. Dr. Nathanson was a brilliant man. I mean, academically off the charts. And, and he knew when to pause, and he paused, and I, I was standing at that point, and, and his wife was beside me, and I didn't know what he'd say, and he said, yes, yes, I do. He said, continue teaching the strategy of how I deceived America. And then he said this. He said, tell America to love one another. Abortion is not love. Stop the killing. The world needs more love, and I'm all about love now. I don't, I don't have that up there. This was his parting message to the United States of America.